Hello and welcome again to Conscious TV. I'm Ian McNay. And today's an interesting guest. Every now and again, someone discovers Conscious TV and, and writes in and says, you've got to check this person out. And it's an old friend and colleague, Andy King, who got in contact with me recently. And he said, just discovered Conscious TV. He really liked it, which is nice. And he said, I know this guy, JC Mack. He would really be an interesting guy for you to interview. Well, we've only met 10 minutes ago, but welcome, JC. Thank you for coming along. Thank you for having me. And we're going to, I think, start. You sent in a fascinating biography, whatever, just a list of things you've done in your life. And the thing that kind of really interested me to start with was something happened to you very dramatic in 2005. Yes. So just take us through that. Okay. Um, I'll just back up a little bit, because just before 2005, I mean, I had spent many years working on my own personal development, and I was uh, working from home. I had a home office, and I was trying to get some business, and I had just been through Eastern Europe and visited 50 different companies, and I had gone suddenly from having all this work to having nobody hire me. So I was sitting in my home office trying to you know, hit the phones, kind of smile and dial and get myself some work. And while I was doing that, I suddenly started to feel a sensation of pins and needles at the top of my head. I didn't pay too much attention to it. And I um, then started feeling it coming up through my fingers, my hands. And then it started coming up through my feet. And then I started getting a little bit concerned. And then it got stronger, and it got stronger, and then it began to feel like um, rushing water. So now I've got this sense of rushing water consuming my body, and this sense of pins and needles, like an energy. And I started to getting concerned, like, oh, maybe this is medical. Maybe, because, I mean, I'm... Sure, yeah. You know, yeah. I'm not someone that has... I've been a pretty straight, middle-of-the-road kind of guy. So I'm suddenly sitting in my office, alone by myself, and I'm having this experience starting to take place. And it gets stronger, and it gets stronger, and it's going up through my arms, and all my bones start to ache. And um, I can feel this the whole thing kind of coming up and accumulating here in my chest and my lower part of my abdomen. And I thought... God, I'm having a heart attack. After all this, I'm having a heart attack. It's going to end here on the floor in this little town in England I'm, I live in. You're on your own. I'm on my own, yeah. right? And um, so I started getting terrified. I started, I hung the phone up, and um, I thought, I, I better kind of get down on the floor in case I fall down. So I kind of got down on the floor to save myself falling. And this got stronger and it got stronger and I started feeling like cramped, like I couldn't move and it started consuming my body. And um, I ended up on the floor kind of curled up, um, waiting to die. And So what was going through your head? You were on the floor waiting to die. Yeah, what this is the you? first thing I'm thinking, this yeah. is it, I'm going to die yeah. here on the floor. After all this, I mean, you know, you're, you, you, one, you know, they say your life flashes in front of you. Well, I don't know about that, but I thought, geez, after all of this, after everything I've done, this is it. This is me on the way out. And it kept going, and it kept going, and I didn't feel any kind of pain, per se. And then I thought, well, oh, maybe it's not a heart attack. I know what it is. It's a stroke. <laughs> so, much better, <laughs> so, no, so now I'm going from having a heart attack to having a stroke, and, and the terror and the fear of leaving the planet, you know, and leaving this body, you know, I had the, um, you know, I don't think I, I hadn't spent a lot of my life thinking about what it would be like at the moment of death. And um, suddenly it seemed like I was confronted with that last moment. And what was I going to do? So I began to go through this series of um, terrifying thoughts, you know, about dying and leaving my body and all of this kind of stuff. And then I'd, um, I remembered this line from, I think it may have been a Zen teaching or something I'd read once, that said, all fear is an illusion, walk straight ahead. 
And I spent many years studying under all kinds of different spiritual... I've been a spiritual seeker most of my whole life. So I... This thought came to me. It just thought it just popped into my head. All fear is an illusion. Walk straight ahead. And I thought, well, if I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go. And at that moment, it kind of changed. And this, I'm still being consumed by this energy. And I thought to myself, I got a choice here. I can either go out holding on, grasping at everything, or I can let go. And and take a chance you know it's like a roll of the dice no, I can either true. I can either surrender and go with the flow or I can hold on and I thought you know what I'm gonna let go and whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen and then when I got to that point I began to see a series like the picture I had in my mind was a set of dominoes all set up and you push one domino and they all start to fall down and each domino represented something in my life I had to let go of. So I had to let go of, I realized I was going to have to let go of my body. I realized that domino fell. And the next one was I was going to have to let go of my mind. I was going to have to let go of my kids. I was going to have to let go of, of um, my family. I was going to have to let go of this career I had worked so hard on. And it just went one after another, after another, after another. And they just started tumbling down. And when the last one fell, everything went completely still. The energy vanished, and along with it, all thought disappeared. And I was consumed with this kind of presence of this, like a field of still, silent love that was emanating from everything as they laid on the floor. And um, I just laid there for the whole day. And then eventually it was dark and I started getting up off the floor. So and you the, lay there for how many hours? Yeah, probably for the afternoon. Yeah. It might have been for the afternoon, maybe two, yeah. three hours. Yeah. In this state and everything just be, was... This, I soon realized that I, w I had, had no more thinking. All my thought had disappeared. So there was no interpretation of anything going on. There was no conceptual thinking going on. And the presence of divinity just kind of shone forth. I now can see that when there's thinking, it's like a filter. And when the thinking disappears, things are the way they are, naturally in reality. And they actually glow and glitter, and you can see that everything's alive. And so this state just, after that last domino fell, and the thought disappeared, I was left in this state. And that was the start of, you know... What, what is with me now. So it stayed, that state has stayed basically. Yes, but it, it's changed because for, for about 11 months after that happened in 2005, I couldn't do anything because there was hardly any thought would, once in a while I'd have a thought, but there wasn't any thinking or any thought. So I really couldn't do anything. It was a kind of catatonic. I couldn't eat. I couldn't function. You couldn't eat? Rarely did I have to, because you need to, eating requires thinking. What am I going to have? Am I going to have the soup or am I going to so have... So it was the decision that the difficult... Yes, difficult you don't, part. and plus I was rarely ever hungry. So I lost a lot of weight. Yeah. I found that I didn't wash much. I kind of ended up, you know, was unshaven a lot of the time. None of my clothes fit me anymore. And I... I, I had a difficult time leaving the flat because the beauty of everything was so staggering. I, I couldn't move. It just incapacitated me. Nor did I think I needed to. I didn't... There didn't seem to be any reason to do anything anymore. The doing was kind of over. Hmm. You know, I could have just happily sat there till I fell over. It wouldn't have been a problem. So that went on for about 11 months. And... Um, I couldn't pay the rent, you know, I couldn't... So you stopped earning money during this took time? No money, was on the brink of bankruptcy, really couldn't function, I've got children, couldn't, all of that, couldn't do anything. But was there any feelings inside you in terms of, or was it just you were blank the whole time? Uh, it isn't like it's blank. 
It's like you're present in a way that's staggeringly beautiful. Without thought, it's quite stunning. Huh. Life is quite stunning. And the, like when I walked in the room, like I can feel the stillness in, in this, whatever you've been doing here. It's like it's alive. There's a still silent, it's like everything is alive. And it's all emanating this still silent state. You look at this plant here, and it's plastic, but it's still yeah. alive, I yeah. guess. <laughs> sure it is. Yeah. Because everything is. Yeah. Because it has an energy to it. Yeah. So that's what it was like. So it was overwhelmingly beautiful. But there's a downside to that, which is I'm a white boy that lives here in the UK, and you've got to pay the bills, and you... So there be, it, things start to get difficult. You see, it's different yeah. if I just had a rock to go sit on and I didn't have responsibilities. It wouldn't have mattered, you know. I mean, I've been quite happy to do that. So after about 11 months, uh, I noticed my thinking started coming back. But it came back in a different way. Whereas before, it was prevalent and at the forefront of my mind. And it's what I used to make my business successful make things happen, have, you know, decide on things in life. So it was like very, I was very sharp and very cutting. You know, my mind was very quick. And it wasn't anything I couldn't respond to very quickly. So that thinking was right at the forefront. When it returned, after it disappearing for 11 months, it, it was like quiet, like on the DOS in the background. I could mm -hmm. sometimes notice it being there. And what would happen would be if there was something to say, it would come to the front and you would say it and then it would vanish back into the background onto the hard drive again. So, JC, when all this happened, did you feel like getting yourself checked out medically at all? Well, yes, the answer to that is yes. But the one thing I realized after all of my study and my, you know, I've spent a lifetime since I was about 14 in a, on one spiritual path or another seeking something. Right. You know, seeking God or right. some version of reality in some way. So my choice was to go down to the high street to talk to the doctor like I had a medical problem or to contextualize it as I've had a spiritual experience and if that's the case, then the solution is spiritual. So something in you kind of knew and felt confident that without necessarily thinking about it, that everything was actually okay and it was some kind of shift in consciousness that happened it, well that everything was so stunningly beautiful and that there was an overwhelming nice, yeah. peace that came yeah. over me that surpassed anything i'd ever done yeah. or or could ever have imagined was an indication to me that i that it wasn't medical no i understand completely. and actually having said that at one point let me back up a sec so when my mind came back or the thinking came back when thought came back what came back with it was my identity. So it's like the ego and my identity vanished and there wasn't any, there was no more JC. There was this thing, like a wind-up toy, that walked around, you know, or, or bathed or got fed, but it didn't have an identity. It was, it was the same, there was no difference in value between this or that or this, or anything. Everything had the same value. Sequence was, had vanished. There was no more timeline. So everything, without thought, everything has the same significance and value. Right. So it's all radiating the same. Right. There's yeah. there no hierarchy of importance. Right. So as my mind came back, my identity started to come back, and then I started having problems. Then the fear and terror came. And for the next year, I cried every day in terror and in fear. I've over, I don't, can't even tell you what. Every dark, terrifying thought I would experience. I was terrified of the dark. I was terrified of what was under my bed. I was terrified of going out. I was, and my mind just went absolutely crazy. And at one point, I was curled up in a ball with my daughter's stuffed teddy bears on the bed, crying, thinking the only way I was going to ever get out of this, because it went on month after month after month, was to end my life. So what were you terrified of? Everything. I know this is hard to describe. It was an unknown, terrifying fear that 
I think it was Dante that said once, beyond this point, give up all hope, in something he had written and wrote mm -hmm. about. It was like a darkness that pervaded everything. And, and, what this, was, and this came in gradually or suddenly it came it in? It came bit by bit as my, mo as, as my thinking returned and my okay. ego returned and my identity returned. I can now see that my identity and my ego was terrified that it just witnessed the end of its life. But was this constant, this new state, were you aware of this underneath the terror and the fear? Or had that disappeared? No, that's always been there. there so would be, even though this, through this difficult time, yes. it's still there. And I think that was one of the... But here's the other part with this, Ian, that it's like being abandoned by God to have your ego come back once you've transcended it. It's different if you fall down and bump your head and it never comes back. It's usually, from my experience, and I've not since talked to other people, a, can be a problem if some version of it, if not all of it, some part of it comes back. Because transcending the ego is what's in the way of having a permanent state yeah. like that, as we all know. Yeah. So once it returns, it sees, oh my God, the end is in sight. The end is in no, sight. I yeah. And at that point, the problem started. Yeah. So I was, at that point, emotionally unequipped to deal with what was happening. And that process landing those two worlds has been the journey for the last since 2005 right did you ever read the book by Suzanne Seagal collision with the infinite no it's a it's not exactly similar but she went through as she went through the same process although the details are different yeah anyway, it's just by the way yeah and how are you now with it The stillness and this living still silence is there all the time. If I get busy with something, I don't notice it as much. But the minute I stop, it, it's, it's like um, it's always in the background as the context of life. Consciousness is always there emanating this right. state. And with our busy minds we don't notice it so there's a lot of noise going on between our ears so that state came to the front and the noise disappeared into the back and so now it's been finding an equal balance so that I can function and work and live in the world and still maintain that but is the anxiety, the fear, the terror is still there? no so how did that go? I just think it went in time. And how long did that take? Two years. Two years from it coming or two years from when the experience happened originally? 2005, 2006, it started, seven, eight, so about two years. Two years, two years it, yeah. of working on integrating yeah. that, having, having, my, you know, having my identity accept what has happened and to be okay with it it's okay you know it's like telling it's like telling that small you look it's okay yeah but on the other hand if you're telling your identity I'm just playing devil's advocate yeah. here if you're telling your telling your identity to, to say the to trying to accept what's happening that's still that's still you that's still an identity yeah i understand and in a way, it's kind of like that identity having a conversation with an identity to try and re meet, meet some yes. agreement. In yeah. a way, it is a bit like that. But I think what um, my identity has come to over the last few years is, the, is I, I, I don't know the ins and outs of it. I, I don't try to kind of figure the whole thing out. What I can report is that that stillness and that silence and that peace has made peace with no, my, I, what's I left of my that. mind. Yeah, yeah. So the battle's over. Yeah. And it is a battle. It is a battle because the, the last thing your identity or ego wants to give up is its position, that it's, it's sovereignty and the thing running the show in your life. It, and once it realizes it isn't, 
the game's pretty much up. It's like pulling bricks out of a dam. Every insight, every distinction, every bit of work you do, every book you read pulls a piece yeah. out of that ego, out of that wall, out of that wall, and then the wall crumbles. Yeah. And the divinity and love of God shines forth. Yeah. Stunning. Yeah. Yeah. And so what do you do in your life now? <laughs> um, that's a good question. I never thought I'd work again. You know, I had a very lucrative executive coaching business. I worked in investment banking. I, you know, flew around in oil companies, Learjets, and coached. So this was really a big, th a, this is a huge change in your life when this completely event happened in 2005, yeah. So, so, so tell us a bit more. We haven't, we haven't looked at your, how you got to where, where, you, where you were in 2005. So tell us a bit more about what you did beforehand. Um, I was born here in the UK. Right. My dad was a footballer in the 40s and 50s. Right. Played for Barnsley, Notts County, Newcastle. No, not Newcastle. Notts County, Barnsley, Gateshead. And um, there's another one, but I can't think of it. Okay. And then when he retired in the early 50s, there was this big migration in this country to either go to Australia or Canada. We went to Canada. Okay. We went to Toronto. Okay. So I grew up in Toronto and uh, moved to the West Coast when I was very young on my own because I was always, I could never, I never felt like I really fit in. Like, I couldn't see myself being the postman, though there's no problem being a postman, but I couldn't see myself having a nine to, you know, I could never really see myself doing that kind of stuff. So. I was always on, had this search, so out to the West Coast, California, Los Angeles, San Francisco in the 60s, and Vancouver, and went through that whole 60s scene in San Francisco, and that whole thing, and chasing gurus, and trying to join cults, looking for this, trying <laughs> diets, doing that, if, you know, if it had, if it had, uh, you know, a peace sign on it, I'd, I'd have gone for it, you know. If it had some holy symbol on their forehead, I'd have joined it. If it had, I was seeking, seeking, seeking. So something was really pulling you to find yeah. something, wasn't it? I think yeah. you were telling me earlier that you, that you, you had this pull to find God even at 15 years yeah. old. Yes, absolutely. And, and so I went through all of that. And, you know, even as a young kid, I got involved in music. I found a guitar in a garbage can in a rubbish bin when I was uh, walking down the street and I painted it and put strings on yeah. it and stuck some pickups in it. And, you know, and in, that, in Toronto, there's a whole kind of blues scene between Toronto, Chicago, Detroit, and Montreal. There's this big scene, you know, blues scene. It was in those days. Right. I'm sure it's different now. So I got, got involved in, that, in all that, playing music, and traveled North America playing music. Again, still searching, still searching for things. Yeah. And eventually kind of left that. I mean, it was music that brought me back here. And, um, but, you know, a lot of um, what went along with that was all the downside of that whole world, you know, and I got mixed up in some of that and, and taking things that weren't good for my health. And eventually it really was started to destroy my health and I got, ended up getting into a lot of trouble. I think you, I think you were saying you sold guns at one time. Yes, did that. Yeah. And, um, you know, drugs and guns and bike gangs and music yeah. and it, it just, it, you know. And but but th that's always interests me. So you, you were selling drugs, you were selling guns or whatever, involving gangs, and yet you had this spiritual side pushing through. Yeah. How, did you, how did you equate those two very polarised views of life? Not very well. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not very well, as they locked the door behind me. Not very well. It was torture. Because I, at one hand, I had this deep desire to find a God of my understanding of something other. There had to be more to it than what I was doing. And at the same time, I was caught up, you know, in that whole scene, in that, you know, gangs and in that whole neighborhood and couldn't get out. I didn't think I was ever going to get out of that. In fact, it was, it was the court's. I was in court and was going to be sentenced to prison for five years. When the judge sent me to a kids program, a street teenager, it was called, it was a, um, some youth, youth program. There's a whole, you know, there's a hundred kids in it. And it was being led, the, the leader of this four-day course was an ex-U.S. Navy SEAL who had 
had three tours of duty in Vietnam, so he was a serious guy. You know? And he got his hands on me, and um, before those four days were over, I could see that, you know what, I could have a great life if I wanted to. I could walk away from this. And the other thing I, he wouldn't let me away with was the fact that I was responsible for everything that happened. I couldn't blame the neighborhood. I couldn't blame my parents. He wouldn't let me do it. He, I couldn't blame the streets. I couldn't... Was hard to take on board at the time? Yeah. Must have been, yeah. yeah. I argued and fought with that guy. Yeah. I argued and fought with him until the light went on. And I got, yeah, that was my choice. I did that. Yeah. I'm responsible for that. And then I realized, well, if I'm responsible for screwing my life up that bad, could you imagine what I, I, I could do if I put a little effort in the other direction, <laughs> right? <laughs> and that was the start of it. So then I read, started reading every this self-help... Is, let's look at this. This is major stuff, you know. So what you're saying is you were involved in street gangs, selling drugs, selling guns, whatever, and then you should have gone to prison or you could have gone to prison, but instead they put you on this program... And in that program, you got this realization yes. that you were responsible for your life yes. and you at one level had created where you were. Yes. This is major, major stuff, you know. That was, and when that insight hit me in that course room, when he was going at me, it was like a hundred pounds of luggage came off my shoulder. One moment life was like that and in a heartbeat it was like a freedom. Like, that was my doing. Yeah. And if I can own that and turn that around, you know that old saying, if he could have only have used it for the power of good instead of evil, <laughs> right? then, you know, I could have a great life. Yeah. And that's when I thought, you know what, that's what I'm going to do. And there was, no, there was no turning back or certain thoughts, you just got it and well, that was it. Well, but that's went. my personality and I've been yeah. obsessed about anything I got involved in. My spiritual yeah. life, music, it was always all or nothing. But you see, I would challenge that. I don't think it's just your personality. I think it's also something deeper in you that you yes. get in touch with. Yes. Yeah, I could agree it's with that. It's very determined and just somehow more aligned with life. Yeah. Or even deeper, that the karmic path that I had and, am, and have ha are, are having in this life was all part of that. Because now I can see it was perfect, that everything that happened was perfect. That nothing that happened shouldn't have happened, which is an impossibility anyway. But a lot of us think that way. Oh, if that shouldn't have happened, it should have been that. Or if it only had been, you know, it's not grounded in much reality. But when I got that insight and that freedom to start to be, I went like hell bent for leather. I read every self help book, I started doing stuff for my health, I joined the gym. I went to courses, I did hundreds of seminars, I, and started training myself as, right. to lead these things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that started pulling me out yeah. of there. And that was yeah. really the pathway that started me getting into the whole business of doing that, yeah. which is what I do now. And so what was, the, what was the kind of first real job you had when you were doing, after doing all this training? Because I think you worked as a drug counselor for a time, didn't yeah. you? Uh, the first one I had yeah. was in a little health food store in Vancouver. And it was for $95 a week. And after being in the world of high-flying, you know, fast money, $95 for 40 hours a week didn't seem like a very good thing, you know. Yeah. I had to ask a couple of guys, what are you supposed to do with 95 bucks? You know, that gets you six pints and, you know, a face full of something else. You know, and that's about it. That lasts about 20 minutes where I came from. Right? They said, yeah. no, you got to put that in the bank. you got to buy some socks. you got to feed yourself. So the first job was in a health food store, and I learned everything there was about health in that store. I read all the books. I worked with all the consultants that came in, all the practitioners. I ended up studying with a um, Blackfoot Native Indian woman, Norma Myers, who started took me on as her apprentice. and I was with her until she died, doing herbs and studying herbs and learning North American herbs. I worked with nutritionists. I worked with vitamins. And that was the first one I had. And then I got... Um, because of my experience, a job working in a, in a detox center. So I started working in the drug and alcohol field. Then I worked as a counselor in Sydney, Australia. Then I came back to Vancouver and worked as a counselor. And so it just kind of went like that. And then I got more involved in developing myself. And I started um, 
working as um, a coach, more as a life coach. Okay. And, um, and in the midst of all that, I got back involved in music because it kind of was felt left, it was left undone. And I produced this album, which eventually brought me back here. Hmm. And then it was a funny thing, you know, I was doing some service work, which I'm a great fan of. And I was walking down the street in Hammersmith, and I bump into this guy I hadn't seen in 10 years who was doing the same training I was doing in San Francisco. He was now working for this American consultancy and team building company from Austin, Texas, working in the oil industry doing team building workshops. He gave me a job. So I got back here, the music thing didn't work out, didn't, couldn't, didn't know what I was going to do. I bump into this guy, I end up doing team building and consulting and coaching in the oil industry. And that's how my, was my entry point into the business world. And from that I ended up leaving that after doing years in the oil business and traveling around the world, coaching people, and then I got into, left that so and went into... So when you coach people, how did you coach them? In, in that context, it's very much in business. People are interested in improving the quality of their, their, their business. So in that context, it's really inside of the objectives of a company. So and it's organ- about maximizing the resources and then yeah. get the best out of the employees and everything, yeah. So though a lot of what I had experienced, I couldn't really say it in that particular way, but a lot of it was very transformational and very leadership-based. So it was the coaching was designed to create a shift or a transformation in the perception of how a person sees themselves as a leader. Because that Navy SEAL, the thing he did was to get me to see myself differently. He made me responsible for my life. He turned me into a leader. And when I left that court, that course room, I realized I wanted to be doing what he was doing. So you wanted to be a leader. Yeah. And I wanted to develop leaders. Yeah. So that's what I ended up doing. Yeah. Which has been a lot of what I've done. And then I left that organization and went into investment banking and started doing that down at Canary Wharf and in the city and did that for some years and up until 2005. And I think you also, didn't you work with a lot of, with a company, lost a lot of people in 9-11 too? Yes. I was working with... a very difficult time. Cantor Fitzgerald lost 500 guys and gals. I was on the trading floor watching that. And um, I had been coaching some of them prior to that and then continued to coach some of them after that. And um, I'll tell you one little story about that. It was some of the, after 15, 20 years of doing that work, people knew me on the trading floor because I had been in and out of there. And Cantor, their kind of answer to try and deal with the scope of the enormity of, the, of that disaster was to get busy and back to work and don't confront it. Just, you can't, you can't take something that big in. You might be able to say, oh, Frank was my friend and we lost him. But you certainly couldn't take in 500 people. Yeah. That's too big. Yeah. So you've got to kind of compensate a bit. So people just got busy. And I would go down there and people would grab me and pull me into a room and just start talking to me about the whole thing. And there was a woman that grabbed me one day and she came in and she had this little book. And she says, I've been writing it all down. This is a couple of months after. I've been writing it all down. She had a book full of... So was she actually in, was in, in, in the Twin Towers? Or no, she was in London. Okay. Right? Yeah. And so, where I was. At the time. Yeah. And she had written it, but she was at the company, the same company. Yes, no, right. I understand. Yeah. So she had written everything down. So she pulled me into the room and sat down. She says, can I tell you this? So she just sat there and read for 20 minutes and was sobbing and reading and sobbing and sobbing. And at the end, she says, well, what do you think? And the only thing I could think of to say to her was, you just need a bigger book, honey. And she said, oh, thank you very much. And she got up and left, and that was it. And I thought, that's some of the best work I ever did. Yeah. So she needed someone to listen yeah. and encourage her just to keep yes. verbalizing, writing, whatever happened. Well, yeah. What am I going to say about that? Yeah. You can be yeah. there for somebody and love them. That's it. Yeah. You can't, you don't have an answer for that. Yeah. So... Was there any clues for you that something like what happened in 2005 was going to happen? 
Was there any little glimpses yes. or signs? Yeah, good point. The, uh, about a year before 2005, I mean, I had meditated for 20 years. I had done a lot of different things, but it, what I can see now, Ian, is that all my whole life has been spent trying to make something mystical or spiritual happen, like a search for that. You know, there's a saying, if you, if you haven't experienced enlightenment, it's, it's special. And if you've had any experience of it, it's not special. <laughs> See? Okay. It isn't special because it's who you yeah. are anyways. Yeah. It's like coming home. Yeah. But that search and that, that insistent noise in our heads that trying to figure all of this out and to think our way into a, a higher state of consciousness and... You know, the harder you try to do that, the more difficult it becomes, I can see now. And so you can drive yourself quite mad trying to think your way into a, through, through all of this, you know. Yeah. If you're lucky, you know, fortunate enough, I, I fell down and it happened, you know. But for 20 years, I tried to think my way to it. And you can't really think your way to God. It's not a conversation, you know. That experience, it's not even an experience, it's a state. It's not experiential. That's more thinking. Yes. So, where was I? I was asking you the question whether you had some experiences or some yes. clues. Yes, sorry. So, a year before that, um, I had a couple of moments where everything stood still. All thought vanished and everything just went still, perfectly still. Everything slowed right down. I was driving my car one day and that happened. And um, I had a thought, if, if I was to spontaneously go into a state of enlightenment, I wouldn't be able to provide for my family. And I started crying, and I couldn't stop. And I had cried for about a year before it happened in 2005. That I was in that state for 10, 11 months after 2005. Then what was left of my mind came back, and I cried for another year, two years in terror. But prior to that, I had cried for a year at everything. I couldn't even tell you what for. And then I was in Sedona, Arizona about six months after that and I was in the mountains and it happened again. Everything went perfectly still mm. and silent. All thought disappeared and the stunning, I have to watch it or I cry, the stunningness of where I was just revealed itself in a way that was overwhelming. Yeah. And then I came back, and shortly after that, it happened in 2005. Yeah. So, you know, I wonder if the intensity of your search, and, and, I, and I know you were doing things that weren't necessarily, obviously, professionally connected with searching, but somewhere you had this thread that you were saying that you were on a search, especially from a very early age. I wonder if that contributed to something happening or whether it just happened by the grace of God in its own time. Well, from your mind's point of view, you would think that enlightenment is caused by something. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure that is the case. It, yeah, it's, my experience is yeah. that cause is like a figment of your imagination. In reality, there's no, nothing causes anything to happen. Enlightenment isn't caused by anything you do. It's a state that arises when the obstacles that are in the way of it are moved out of the way. But that's not caused by anything. It's more like a set of conditions that then reveal the state. Mm. So it emerges, but not caused. Cause is a linear kind of process of your mind. If you're, if you're thinking, then there's time, there's distance, there's sequence, there's cause, there's effect, the Newtonian paradigm that we deal with, which is very effective, we need, you know, it's in this world, is one of cause and effect. When your mind vanishes, it doesn't look like that anymore. Nothing's causing that stunning revelation of stillness and peace is not being caused by anything. Well, when you were in that very difficult period when you were crying for a year, nine months after the, let's say, the awakening, the opening happened, what actually helped you the most during that time? I had a friend that finally started coming around that had a similar experience and she would say to me, stop all your spiritual practices. 
start eating more meat. Mm. Go out, hug a tree. I used to go, here's what I started doing once I finally did start coming out of the house. I couldn't make it into the backyard without weeping. It was so beautiful. Mm. I started to go down to the corner of the high street where there's a waitrose. And there's a little cost of coffee in there. And I would go sit there and watch people. And it was like everybody was asleep. You know, they were walking around like automatons, mm. asleep. But I kept going to this restaurant, uh, not rest, to this coffee bar. And how, that, how was that for you to see everybody was asleep? Um, quite lonely. Isolated. Mm. And I had been isolated because I couldn't, I started surfing the internet looking for help. Yeah. And finding people. And there was, you know, I went to the Zen community in Reading and... A lot of people have heard about those things, but there wasn't very many people that we could have reported having the experience. And what I was looking for was someone that had had the experience that could advise me on what was next. I understand, yeah. And that's what I was having difficulty with. Yeah. So I ended up, I felt very much alone. And I used to go down to Waitrose just to be around people. Yeah. Uh, one day I was walking out and I was in the bread section and everything went into this state of, stunning perfection all the bread and I started weeping and the manager had to take me out of the store yeah you know another time I got in my car and I suddenly realized everybody was beeping their horn at me and when I looked I realized I was doing 10 miles an hour because everything was in slow <laughs> yeah. motion everybody wanted to you know hey you yeah. lunatic would you put yeah. you know yeah. so I started going out a bit I stopped all spiritual practices. I started trying to talk to people a little more. I felt it very difficult to find anybody I could speak to about it that wouldn't think I was either insane or should be put on something yeah. or locked up. And I'm quite, quite certain if I had gone to the right people, they would have locked me up from what they could see. In fact, at one point, I went to a doctor and spoke to him. I've since become friends with a couple of psychiatrists who, who work with some of this stuff. And... I went to this doctor and, and said, um, I have no desire to do anything anymore. I have no sexual drive. I, there isn't anything I'm trying to accomplish. I don't want to climb the corporate ladder anymore. Um, there's nothing I want to do. I, I'm consumed with an overwhelming stillness and a peace beyond anything I can describe. And he says, I think you're depressed. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought, well, God, man, if this is depression, <laughs> give me some more, you know. Yeah. If this is what depression is all about, thank you, I'm doing fine. And I left yeah. and I never went back. Yeah. So it's really, the, it's, earlier I said the doing kind of ends. You really don't see that there's anything to do because who you're becoming is enough. So, so again, so, so that last bit again, so I get that. Doing yeah. starts to come to an end. Okay. Because who, who you're, you're becoming... becoming is more than enough. So there's something happening on its own without any contribution from your mind up here. Yeah. And that in itself is very fulfilling and... Well, there's nothing happening. That's okay. another mentation, yes? Okay. Like now, there isn't any of that either. Because that's a timeline. If there's now, there's a then, there's an over there. When all that vanishes, there isn't anything happening. Yeah. <laughs> happening is... a. You can only have happening if you've got thought. When all the thought disappears and there isn't anything happening other than the emergence of the stunning brilliance of the way everything is. Like a still living piece beyond description. And when you see somebody or somebody suffering, is it still the case? You just see it as... Yeah, well, it, that, that looks not like suffering, but more like compassion. What you see... So feeling arises of compassion. Yes. Yeah. You see, I had to watch. I had to watch myself because uh, what I wanted to do was hug everybody. And you can't do that at Canary Wharf. We <laughs> <laughs> would get locked up, yeah. You know. Yeah. One time, I, I couldn't work. I couldn't do anything. And, and uh, I got a... Uh, I had a camera. I used to like taking pictures of, of musicians. You know, that was a lot of fun. And... Um, I hadn't worked it. I was really dire. Right. And I finally got somebody to give me a job to go down to somewhere in London, I can't remember where, to photograph uh, an old jazz player. 
I can't even remember his name. He was a saxophone player. He was being knighted. If I okay. think of his name, I'll tell you. Yeah. So I thought, my God, it's, it's work. I got to go. So I jump on a train. And at this point, I'm absolutely right out of, you know, I'm in this, this, this time when things are really bad. My mind is kind of returned and I'm feeling kind of suicidal and crazy and, and like it's never going to end and it's dark. It's like that Dante thing I told you. I'm in that stage. Right. Yeah. So he got on the, on the uh, train with my camera and I'm standing there and I'm in the subway in London, in the tube, I should say. And I'm standing there completely in bits and then I feel this, someone hold my hand in this packed train I'm standing in. Right. With. And I look down and it's this little girl. She's about six, and she thinks I'm her dad. Oh. And her dad's standing beside me, yeah. and she holds my hand. And, I th and she doesn't look at me, she just reaches up yeah. and holds my hand. And I thought, it was like God saying, it's, it's going to be okay, John. It was a sign saying I, yeah. I know it's hard, but it is going to be okay. Yeah. And then it started to turn around. Huh. And I went down and I photographed that musician and I came back home and then another little thing happened and I got a little bit of work there and, it, and then gradually it's all started to come back without me doing anything. Yeah. I get on my knees every morning and surrender my will and my life to... Is that right? You start your, you start your every day, day you surrender Then to I life, sit yeah. up at the wall, do a Zen practice and meditate yeah. for half an hour just at the wall watching my breathing yeah then i do a little chant and then i start the day mm. and some days i can kind of function quite well and other days i go into this timeless space and all of a sudden it's nighttime and it's over yeah and um i would like to talk more about this this isn't something i can talk about in business so i'd like to move more towards speaking i'm speaking at the mind body spirit event coming up okay and um, I think there's something else. So yeah. I put a little website up, and I've, if, you know, if anybody would like me to come and talk to them about this, I'd love to do it. So I'd like to do some more of that, but yeah. we'll, we'll see what God's got up his sleeve. Okay, we need to finish, and that's a lovely place to finish. Yes. Seeing what God's got well, up his sleeve. Thank you, Ian. Thank God you for coming in, yeah. JC. Thank you. And uh, good luck with everything. Thank you. you certainly had a, yes. you certainly had an interesting experience there, <laughs> and. Uh, I understand that whole incorporation into life is very difficult after that. Yeah, yeah and I just going to finish on one thing. I just would like everybody to know that everything is okay. Y you know, the end is certain. You don't have to struggle with this. Yeah. I, used to, I struggled for 20 years trying to make something like this happen. You know, to realize, you know what, it's fine. It's fine. Be kind and loving to everything, including yourself, and you'll get there. That practice in itself will take you all the way. Wonderful. <laughs> okay, thank you. okay. Thank you. Thank you, JC. And thank you again for watching Conscious TV. And I uh, hope we see you soon. Goodbye.